Who gave you the box? My mom. I know They're ready for you. All right. Uh, you keep playing with the box. I'm going to check back on you in a little bit. Box. That's how he fucking eats. I. I. I hope you're okay. I do. I, I hope you're okay. I'm not gonna ask. You know, I just hope you're okay. That's not a question you can throw around casually anymore, you know? How you doing? We've been through too much and lost too many people and been through too much struggle. You ask somebody how they doing now, you better be careful, because they might tell you. <laughs> and that'll throw off your whole day. You ever had somebody you don't give a damn about start sharing their pain? Woo -woo. It'll throw off your whole schedule. Hey, what's going on, man? How you been? Well, the dog caught COVID and I gotta call you back. That's my bad. That's my bad. I thought you know I didn't give a shit. I'm so sorry for asking. I'm so sorry. It's not a casual question. I called my uncle. This is why I knew my uncle was going through some shit. I called my uncle. I said, uncle, what's going on? He said, well, you know, ain't nothing that the ancestors can't get me through. I was like, oh, shit. This motherfucker is summoning dead black people. That's when you know black people going through some shit. When you start calling them the ancestors, calling on black people floating around you protecting, which should just go to show you that's how stressful it is being black. Even after you die, you got to stay on earth to give motherfuckers tips. <laughs> Can't even go to heaven. Soon as you get to floating up to heaven, somebody down on earth, ancestors, I need you. Ain't this a bitch. <sighs> My black friends always talking about their ancestors. My white friends always talking about their forefathers. <laughs> which is two totally different types of dead people. <laughs> and look, I'm, I'm not saying you're a racist if you bring up the forefathers, but I am saying you have my undivided attention. <laughs> you know, because it, it's not racist, but it just feels... It, you know, something that ain't racist, but it, it's got the residue. It's got the residue. <laughs> of racism on it. So you know what it feel like? You know, it's like when somebody starts talking about their forefathers, you know what it feel like? If it, you, you ever been somewhere and it's too many American flags? <laughs> it just feels... It's a little too much freedom in this space. <laughs> and it just don't feel right. Like, how many American flags equal one Confederate flag? <laughs> I don't know what the number is, but there is a number. And that's how I be feeling when people get to talking about their forefathers, but I ain't trying to hear that shit. You know, Roy, this is a layered conversation with a lot of nuance, and I just think we need to think about what our forefathers would have. Hey, I think my ancestors would want your forefathers to shut the fuck up. How about that? Denver, Colorado, what's going on? How y'all doing tonight? Oh, that's good. I meant it that time. I meant it that time. <laughs> we just out here trying to live, man. That's all we're trying to do. Anything to feel good. That's what we after now. And you can't be embarrassed for trying to do that. Like, we try to follow all the rules and regulations, but every now and then, you just, you just, you'd be at the house, you'd be like, just fuck it, I, 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 I'm okay if I catch it. I got to go and get out. <laughs> you at the house, man. We at the house dealing with all of this shit. Oh, the virus is out there. You know what else is a disease? Fucking sadness. <laughs> it's tough. That's why I ain't mad at people. Whatever you got to do to feel good, do that shit. Like, at this point, life is basically a crab leg, and we're just all trying to work that bitch <laughs> and trying to find that one little nugget of feel good inside that <laughs> Oh, no. Oh. Oh, I found a little feel good today. I found just a little bit. 
Mm -mm -mm. Smallest things will send you to the moon. You post a picture of yourself online, somebody like it, you like, ooh. <laughs> We're so wild, we're so addicted to that, that, that our own face ain't even enough. We've lost confidence in our own face. Won't put a picture of yourself online without putting a filter. You know, have a filter, mm, swing, swing. So, okay, that's the one I'm gonna post, that's the one. You gotta have dog ears on your head. Why don't, don't run from the truth. Don't be putting no filters on your pictures. Accept the truth. Your mama's a nine, your daddy's a two. It is what it is. <laughs> Stop putting filters on yourself. They got one app, they got one app. This, this shit is wild, they, they got an app where all it do is show you what you look like when you 80. That's it, that's all it is. It don't do nothing else. You take a picture of yourself now as a young person and you put it in your phone and we don't do 80, that's it. Have we lost that much hope that we need a sneak preview of old age? Like, who is it that's a sneak preview of when you 80? Who is this app for? Like, well, other than black men, because we might not make it there, but. <laughs> mm. You never know. Anything, man. Women getting plastic surgery to feel good. Yeah, Brazilian butt lifts. That's what they're doing, fellas. Brazilian butt lifts, that's what the women are doing. They're going down to South America. You, do you know what the Brazilian butt lift is? They, they go down there and they slice your booty cheek open. They, they slice your booty open and they take some of your belly and they put it in your ass and they stitch you up and they put you on a Spirit Airlines flight back to the States. <laughs> that's what they're doing, which is fine. I'm not hating on plastic surgery. If that's your crab leg, work it out. Do what you do. <laughs> My problem is that women, y'all will get the new ass and then you get on the internet and talk shit to men. Why are you attacking my self-esteem? You got a belly booty, congratulations. Go enjoy your belly booty. But that's not what they do. The women get the new ass and then you be bent over on Instagram. Look at all this ass. Do you have enough dick for it? No, ma'am, I don't. I don't have enough. I cannot reach it from this angle, ma'am. You, you put a foot of meat in front of your put. I, I cannot get to it from this way. You can't move the goalpost and turn around and talk shit. Hey, turn around, we gotta do it front ways. It's the only way. <laughs> white people doing what they can to feel good now. I see what you're doing out there, white folks. White allies. That's what we got now, black people. White allies. And you gotta call them that, they like that. <laughs> white allies. And we know you're a white ally because you won't stop telling us at your job <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I just want you to know that I see you and I understand your journey. And anytime you want to have a dialogue, would you like to have a dialogue? <laughs> Stop talking to your black friends about race. Talk to your forefathers. <laughs> Call them up. And I'm not trying to attack white folks. I know you've done a lot of good shit. I don't want you to think I'm taking nothing away from you. And we just seen you out there putting in the work. You got your shirts on with your little slogans. You know, pretty much whatever you stand for as a white person, there's a slogan shirt for you. Black live and trans live and pussy hats. There's a lot of merch. Y'all got a lot of merch in this ally game right now. Which is cool, because the merch, the shirt does half the work for you now. The shirt breaks the ice for you. It's easy to be a white ally now. Shit, if you was a white ally in the 90s, you know how hard that shit was with no merch? You just had to be nice to niggas and grin at them and hope they figured it out. You know how much pressure that is as a white person? <laughs> we can hold the elevator door open and look ding! Did you see what I did? I, I... But you could be doing more, white folks. Don't think that what you've done is enough. We appreciate what you've done, but you could do more. Dig deep and help out your goddamn black friends. We seen what y'all was doing at the Capitol. Do that shit for us. Yeah. Storm the Capitol for your black friends. Inside of every white person in this room is a Capitol rioter. You should dig deep and find them. 
You can storm the Capitol for a number of reasons. That ain't got to be the only reason. Do it for us. You think we ain't discussed that at the black meeting? You think black people ain't discussed storming a government facility <laughs> as one of the options for getting our freedom? Yeah, but you cannot do that if you're black. You can't just go grab a shotgun and go to DC and then boom, bitch, where the freedom at? <laughs> <laughs> you will get shot immediately. Immediately, you will get shot. You'd get shot at the house booking the flight. You wouldn't even, <laughs> you wouldn't even get to DC. Storm that capital on black people's behalf. And take a couple of Asians with you. Maybe we'll get some laws passed too. Because <laughs> that's the one thing we don't get, black folks. We don't get no legislation. And they give us everything but legislation. We do all the marching and hooping and hollering and they won't pass a goddamn law. We be asking for the law. Can you pass a law so that they'll stop this shit? Well, What about a mural? Would you like a mural? It's colorful, it make it the whole crosswalk. I mean, a mural? Oh, bitch, we don't want no mural, we want the laws. What about Juneteenth, it's a holiday. You like Juneteenth, right? It's extra barbecue, don't you want some more barbecue? Yeah, man, white folks are contributing, it's good. It's good to see white people contributing. There's a lot of white people contributing, black folks, that we don't recognize, and we got to start tipping our hat to them. Some white folks have been doing some really dope shit, helping black folks. You know, you, know, you, know one, you know one white ally that goes unsung, in my opinion, is evil white actors in civil rights movies. <laughs> These are unsung heroes of the movement. Because here's the thing, if you're gonna have a black struggle movie and you're gonna tell the truth, that means you have to show some heinous shit happening. And to show heinous shit happening, that means you need white actors being motherfucking terrible on camera. <laughs> you gotta have it. And I've met some of these white actors. These are good, normal ass white boys. They got to walk on set all nice and then just turn on the racism. <laughs> you know what kind of pressure they under? You gotta walk on set, say nigga for 12 hours. <laughs> gotta eat lunch by yourself. Nobody talks to you. <laughs> Gotta walk on set all chipper and shit. Hey, good morning, how you doing? Hey, guys. Hey, hey, director, good to see you. Hey, Denzel, good to see you too. It's what, uh, uh, we ready? And action. You are nigga. <laughs> Is that good? Uh -huh. We gotta go again? Oh, my God. <sighs> I'm sorry, Denzel, we gotta go again. I don't want to. If you're gonna tell the history of my people the right way every now and then, you need a white actor being a heinous motherfucker on that camera. You telling me Leo DiCaprio didn't kill it in Django Unchained? <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio transformed in that movie. That's one of the bravest white allies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Turned into an evil ass enslaver. Called Jamie Foxx a nigga to his face. His face, Dude, not an empty chair, but like they did the CGI Jamie Foxx later. <laughs> Jamie Foxx was in that room and Leo was right there grabbing Kerry Washington and shit by the hair. <laughs> Just being disrespectful. <laughs> fucking put 10 toes in the ground and called fucking Jamie Foxx a nigga to his face in front of Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> Bravery. And all they do, they love to say, oh, Tom Cruise does his own stunts. Well, so does Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> That's a wild stunt. Right next to Samuel L. Jackson. Look Jamie Foxx dead in the face. You said you would be willing to pay an exorbitant amount of money for what you consider to be the right nigga. Well, it would seem to me this lady right here is indeed the right nigga. <laughs> Same dude from Titanic, y'all. <laughs> You just gotta respect that transformation. <laughs> this dude went from Titanic to enslaver. <laughs> Near, far, <laughs> wherever <laughs> you are, nigga. <laughs> I 
after Django, this, this is what the sacrifice Leonardo DiCaprio made. After Django Unchained in 2012, it was almost 10 years before he did another scene with a black co-star. That's how they, I'm not calling the man racist. He's done movies with every minority you can, he did a movie with a bear. He's a solid dude. <laughs> But he knew, he knew when he made that movie. Once you call Jamie Foxx and Kerry Washington nigga in front of Samuel L. Jackson, you got to lay low for a decade. <laughs> and that's sacrifice. If anybody know Leo, tell him he can come home. Tell him it's time. <laughs> we trying, man. Anything to feel good. Some of us out there, we're trying to just help other people to feel good. That's our crab leg. It's trying to help other people. You want to, and sometimes the system don't let you do everything you want to do the way you want to do it. I got, I got two cops in my family, which, which is kind of like saying some of my best friends are black. <laughs> yeah. What do I do? I got two cops in my family. Chicago suburb and a Mississippi State Trooper. We get to talking about everything that's going on, man. And I was trying to explain to them, it's base level shit the police could be doing. We ain't talking legislation and policy, just base level shit you could do to help build a bridge, to make things a little better. First thing the police need to do, this, this is one thing I think the police should start doing. Stop talking in code on the radio. Use regular words. Why y'all talking all these abbreviations and shit? Why are you, why are you keeping secrets? Secrets is what got you in trouble all this time. Stop keeping secrets. You ain't in a rack. You ain't giving away your position to the enemy. Use regular work. You're in front of the Walgreens. I can see you. Everybody can see you. But that ain't what the police do. You heard the police talk to each other on the radio? The shit is gibberish. Anytime the police talk to each other, it's just gibberish. Three Victor, two David, two David, two Victor. Come on, I'm gonna throw it. And we be watching the police in the grocery store. They see us looking at, looking at the radio. The police love to play it off, act like they understood what dispatch was talking about. <laughs> three Adam David, three Adam David, three respond code, two Victor, three Adam David, three Adam David, three Victor, ten, four, three. Like, you don't know what she just said. <laughs> Stop fucking around. You don't know what she just said to you. You wonder why the police show up and shoot the wrong person. <laughs> because you ain't getting the right information through the radio. <laughs> Slow it down. Slow it down, use regular words. All you got to do, man, I was, I was trying to explain this shit to my cousin, man. Like, if, like the other thing that'll take some of the heat off the cops is that if enough of y'all just did your job right for a little while, some of the heat will come off you. If you do your job well enough, long enough, people will let a couple things slide. They'll let some stuff slide. Just do the job for a little while. Look at the fire department. Everybody, everybody love firefighters. Everybody love firefighters. The, the, the truck passed by, you be cheering for them. <laughs> everybody love fire. Firefighters get the same hero love as cops. None of the scrutiny. You've, you've never looked at a firefighter and wondered to yourself if he's one of the good ones. They're just firefighters. Everybody love firefighters. But don't forget, firefighters in the 60s used to shoot black people in the face with water. They were terrible. Firefighters were a bunch of terrible, evil motherfuckers. And then one day they had a meeting. <laughs> and they was like, you know, maybe we should just put out fires. <laughs> and stop shooting these niggas in the face with the water and we've been cool with the fire department ever since. <laughs> we love the fire department. We so, we so good with the fire department, they don't even show up to our protests anymore. That's why all the shit be burning. <laughs> Cause they're a good ally. <laughs> Plus if you are a racist firefighter, like how would you, how would you be a racist firefighter? Like, you in the smoke, you can't see who you saving. <laughs> if you're a racist firefighter, that means you got to listen for race in the dark, patting around. <laughs> you know how racist you got to be to hear black over the crackle of flames? 
patting around. Fire department, call out. Fire department, you in here? I'm over here, cuz. Save me, dog. <laughs> This floor is all clear. Hit it upstairs. <laughs> right to that engine, 13 upstairs. 13 take the It's a lot of shit the cops could be doing, man. The other thing, the other thing the police could do, this would really build a bridge. Every cop in this country, once a month, let a nigga go. <laughs> I'm serious. Not, not, not every day, not every shift, not every week, but just once a month, just let a nigga go. It's like someone who you know for sure should be going to jail. You got them dead to rights. You got all the evidence. You can take them in. Just open the car door. Just, you good, bro. Go on. <laughs> you good, fam. Go on. Take that real quick. Too big to David. Let the nigga go. Roger that, bitch to David. Nigga go. Let the nigga go. And, and not for every crime. I'm not saying for all crime. There's certain crimes that have to be part, like the murder, the ATF, SVU. Like you keep the hits. <laughs> you know, the major crime, you still gotta go to jail for that. But a lot of crime that's out there that cops take us to jail for, you ain't got to take me to jail for this, man. Come on, dog. An expired tag, man. Don't let these folks turn you into a bill collector. You you <laughs> took an oath to fight crime. Let me go to work so I can get the money to unexpire my tag, sir. <laughs> You don't have to write me a ticket for that. Just because it's a crime don't mean that you've got to enforce it. Really, really, dog, crack. You gonna take me to jail for some crack? <laughs> like crack, that's what, you, that's what we arresting people for still. Crack cocaine, not a shipment of crack. I'm talking about my own personal allotment for me. My own, per my rock, my a crack. One, a single rock, a crack. You gonna take me to jail for a crack, sir? That's what you gonna do? <laughs> it's drugs, dog. It's an addiction. It's not criminal. Drop me off at the Don't Do Crack No More building <laughs> and go fight the real crime. Because that's how you build the bridge. Because the rift between good cop and bad cop and the argument, it just boils down to who had a good interaction with the police. That's all it boils down to. And if once a month you letting the nigga go, you are creating allies out the ass. Because <laughs> that's who's going to defend you at the next protest. Who you think going to defend you at the next protest? You wouldn't even need all that Blue Lives Matter flag. Did you start letting niggas go free once a month? <laughs> we got to defund the police. Abolish these police. Hang on, hang on now, baby. Hang on. <laughs> I had some crack on me last Thursday. <laughs> That brother just let me go. <laughs> Look, this is a nuanced conversation with a lot of layers to it. We just need to think about what our forefathers would have wanted. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm gonna go smoke some crack. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's the rift. All these people have had all these great experiences, and then there's a lot of people who hadn't had a good experience with the Like, if you've had a good interaction with the police, especially if you're black, you can't even tell nobody. <laughs> I had a life-changing run-in with a good cop one time. It was 2003. <laughs> I was in South Dakota. <laughs> Don't ask why, all right? <laughs> there was money, there was money there, so I drove. And I'm riding around South Dakota with Alabama plates. <laughs> so, yeah, you already knew they was gonna pull me over on that. I was in South Dakota, and the cop pulls me over, and I blow a .07. Which isn't the legal limit, but it's close. I can feel the judgment. <laughs> it's not the legal limit, but it's close. And it's negative 20 outside. It's negative 20 degrees outside. So cold that I passed the first breathalyzer. 
like the wind, the wind is swirling and it's coming back through the tube. And I blew a, I blew through the tube. I blew like a .01 the first time. I looked at the cop. I was like, well, I'm victorious. <laughs> and the cop was like, nah, dog, you gotta get in the car. Let's run it back. Best two out of three. Come on back. <laughs> and I get in the car, I blow a .07. And the cop, I can see him deciding whether or not he's gonna take me in on this one. And I start explaining to him the situation. I say, sir, before you make a decision on whether or not you're gonna charge me with this buzz driving, drunk driving thing, I need to let you know that I am a stand-up comedian who drives from state to state. My driver's license literally is my employment permit. Without that, I cannot, I will effectively be unemployed. And I can see the cop thinking about it. The cop goes, all right, well, here's what we are gonna do, man. Rather than take you to jail, give me the keys to your car, and I want you to walk back to your hotel. <laughs> Negative 20. <laughs> Two miles. To, or be unemployed, which, which do you choose? The walk. The walk. The walk. I said, I, thank you, sir, and I'm looking froze. <laughs> Tell you something, two miles and negative 20 might as well have been 40 miles. Like, it, I almost died. I almost died. But the next morning, I go down to the front desk of the hotel, and I'll be damned. This police officer was a man of his word. At the front desk was my car keys, and he had them wrapped up in a nice little Jesus brochure. I didn't like that. <laughs> now, that I didn't like. Because he was treating me like I needed AA, and like, like, like I needed Jesus or something. He had all the Bible verses. The little bro, you know how like you get drunk and they give you them get your shit together brochures? <laughs> he had my car keys stuffed in a bunch of them get your shit together brochures. And I'm like, I don't need Jesus. I just need to use my turn signal. That, 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 we would have never met. <laughs> but that moment, man, that moment changed my trajectory for the rest of my life. I never buzzed drive, drunk drive, never did anything of the like again. And I didn't have to go to jail to learn that lesson. And I'm thankful to that cop for doing that. Like, I really appreciated that. And it's a story I never forgot. And it's also a story I could never share at a black barbershop. <laughs> they would run me out of the barbershop. As soon as I go in the barbershop and say, I sat in the front seat of a police car, they'd be like, oh, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Man, you lying. You ain't never sit in no front seat. Point oh seven and in the front seat. Oh, I'll shut your ass up. Because this is the thing, if you're black and you had a good run-in with the police, you're basically the farmer that saw the alien. That's who you are. <laughs> That's how you sound. You sound like the farmer who saw it. I'm telling you what I saw. It was some bright lights. Something grabbed me. <laughs> then it just let me go. <laughs> I'm like, man, shut your ass up. <laughs> The last black person to have a positive interaction with the police and speak about it on the record is Ice Cube. <laughs> Just yesterday, them fools tried to blast me. <laughs> Saw the police and they... <laughs> that was 30 years ago, y'all. <laughs> and we never forgot that one cop. <laughs> and he didn't even do shit to Ice Cube. He didn't pull him over and give him ice cream. He just let him go. Ice Cube was sitting at a red light. That cop saw Ice Cube and drove off, and Ice Cube was like, oh, shit, I gotta go to the studio right now. <laughs> Call DJ Pooh. We got to fucking make a track about this shit. What's the score of the Lakers Supersonic game? Anything to feel good. That's what we're trying to do, man. Anything to feel good. But you gotta be careful, though. Because a lot of people out there, the only way they know how to feel good is to make you feel bad. You gotta keep your head on the swivel for these folks, because they out there and they ain't doing well. They ain't doing well. 
They got a full clip, they got an empty heart, and they ain't had a crab leg in a long time. <laughs> so you gotta keep your head on the swivel. Them folks got guns, they ready to shoot up whatever, anywhere. That's why we gotta bring back profiling. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna be real. Like, I know it ain't worked out well for us. But there's a lot of different ways you can profile, not just racial. I ain't say racial profiling, just bring back profiling. Trying to stop these mass shootings, there's certain stuff you got to be looking for on people in public. Like when I'm out, I'd be checking everybody's haircut. That's the first thing I look at. <laughs> I don't trust nobody with a messed up haircut. It's too many different ways to edge yourself up for $3. <laughs> look, go look at the mugshot. Look at the mugshot of any mass shooter. All of them, fucked up haircut. <laughs> Just sideways, yeah, yeah. That's who we need to be focused on. Every time a mass shooting happens, we ask all the wrong questions. What about, what about mental health awareness? What about, what about the gun laws? Fuck all that. Who was his barber? <laughs> who gave him the murder cut? That's who we need to talk to. You got to be on the lookout. You got to be on the lookout in this country for people that ain't doing well. I was in Home Depot, the dude, I was walking into Home Depot, the dude in front of me was walking diagonally. I was like, right. I'm good. I left, I went to Lowe's. I was like, right, get out of here. Don't be around no diagonals. I am a perpendicular American and I don't trust. I wouldn't talk to the manager, everything. I turned into a Karen. I went to the manager, I was like, you know you got some diagonals in here? I'm gonna go in here and find these diagonals and get them out. <laughs> Mass shootings, man. Mass shootings especially fucked up if you're from the hood. It's especially messed up if you're from the hood, a mass shooting. That, that was the whole point of getting out the hood, was to get away from the murder. That's what they tell you growing up in the hood. Get you an education, get you a job, get out there and see the world. Well, bitch, I did. They shooting over there too. I'm back. <laughs> I'm better off here the whole time. Say what you want about the hood, but at least they shoot motherfuckers one at a time. <laughs> you got a chance. I understand gentrification now, I get it. White folks coming back around black people where it's safe. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Oh my God, did you see all that murder out there? It's okay, I'm an ally, good to meet you. Whew. Where can I get some almond milk around here? Whoa. Whoa. It's okay, I'll buy the block, but good to meet you though, good to meet you. <laughs> you gotta watch out for these folks. Recognize the signs and the people that you care about, check on them. Because there's some people out there, the only way they know how to feel good is to make themselves feel bad. Happiness is such a foreign concept to them that the moment that happiness even remotely presents itself, they'll self-sabotage it. We all been there. You gotta recognize these people who make themselves feel bad. You know who they are in your circles. It's the people in your, in your, in your phone that don't do nothing but watch documentaries. You, you, you gotta check on these people. <laughs> them documentary people, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> and I'm not attacking you. If that's your crab leg, hey, enjoy your crab leg. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the thing with them documentaries. The problem with you documentary people is that y'all watch like eight, nine of them in a row and then keep recommending them to us and recommending and recommending and re Have you seen the documentary about the fucking, no! No, nigga, I ain't watched the last five. You told me to watch. I know the world is fucked up. I don't need to hear narration over a documentary every time. And I'm not saying don't watch documentaries. I love a good documentary, but after two documentaries, I'd watch me the Paw Patrol movie for balance. <laughs> you, you need leverage. You could be watching all them documentaries in a row. You know them documentary people, they, ne they never in a good mood. You know the problem with, them, with you documentary people is that y'all don't like, you gotta be more excited when you pitching it. <laughs> y'all never, you, you're never upbeat. <laughs> you know, I would, I would watch a documentary if you came to, hey man, I saw a great documentary about the end of the world. It's a good documentary. 
but that's not how y'all come to us. Y'all come to us all cryptic and shit. I just saw a documentary about the thing, and they found two fingers inside the tire of the car, and they traced the fingers back to a whopper. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying, if you wanna watch a couple documentaries, ma'am, you gotta break it up, watch a Fresh Prince rerun, do something else. <laughs> respectfully, I don't know you, but respectfully. <laughs> yeah. Watch too many of them documentaries, you become a diagonal. <laughs> I don't want that for you. Seems like a nice perpendicular woman right there. <laughs> it's the same thing with civil rights movies. Same thing, same thing with civil rights movies. I watch them, I watch a civil rights movie, but you can't watch too many civil rights movies. It'll alter you. You know, matter of fact, matter of fact, I think all these streaming, like all these streaming services, they should, the, the, black people shouldn't be allowed to watch more than two a year. <laughs> Just to help keep us calm, for our own mental health. You should not be like, cause, cause you know what they do, like you watch one slavery and then the algorithm show you 12 more slaveries to choose from. <laughs> you cannot watch 12 slaveries in a week and be normal. You be walking around work mad in the motherfucker, you. <laughs> two slavery max, like that's, like, after you watch a second slavery, like, a prompt should just come up on the screen. Hey, dog, that's enough. <laughs> you good, bro. You, 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 you caught up. Just watch your two slaveries and you keep it moving, man. Did you know there's a Paw Patrol movie? Let me give you the Paw Patrol movie real quick, bro. I know a lot of people don't like those movies. I understand it. I understand the feeling. It's black pain, it's terrible shit being documented on screen. People making money off of it, you know, but our history got to be somewhere. It ain't in the textbooks. So, until we get some better options, we just got to have a couple struggle movies every now and then. It is what it is. But I'll tell you what throw me off though, I be watching them civil rights movies, man. What throw me off, I watch a civil rights movie and be like, oh, damn, that was a good ass movie. And then two weeks later, you find out the main black dude in the movie is British. You be like, ah, shit. <laughs> Motherfucker got me. Cause them black Brits, they good. The anger is a compliment. Them black Brits, they, they so good, it feel like betrayal. You be watching the movie, this motherfucker be Martin Luther King, I'll have a dream and then a dream and I'll be dreaming and then a dream. <laughs> and then you see him two weeks later in the interview. Well, my job was one of Jubal and I had day. Well, all right, and it went my nickels. <laughs> I'm like, why is Dr. King talking like this? <laughs> and this might not be an issue for most people, but every black person remember the day they found out Idris Elba wasn't from Baltimore. <laughs> Oh, my God. That was a troubling day in the black American community. It's like finding out your daddy wasn't your daddy. It's Idris Elba, that's Stringer Bell from The Wire. That's Stringer Bell, dog. I'm like, nah, dog, that motherfucker from over there. No, he ain't, you shut the fuck up. <laughs> and then you saw Idris, you saw, him in the, you saw him in the interview. Well, I tell you, for breakfast, me love a warm bowl of beans. <laughs> like, oh! This nigga eat beans for breakfast? Oh, not my dog. Not my dog. No. Oh, no. Oh. I think, I think part of the rift between black Americans and black Brits, it just boils down to we don't know enough about foreign black people's struggle. We don't know enough about black British people because they don't teach us their history. And if I don't know your pain, I can't trust you to portray mine on camera. That's the, that's the issue. But it ain't black Brits' fault. It ain't they fault we don't know shit about their history. They ain't teaching us foreign racism in America. <laughs> we ain't learning about the struggle across the diaspora. We just now learning about Tulsa. That shit happened around the corner. <laughs> yeah, we, did, we too busy learning Roman numerals in America. <laughs> They ain't teaching you about the struggle across the diaspora. They only gonna teach you, thank God I know the Roman numerals. Now I know which Super Bowl we own. <laughs> Fucking idiots. 
So a different type of nigga pull up to the country, you don't know shit about him. You like, motherfucker, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know nothing about Brits, not for real. And then on the same token, black Brits don't know nothing about us. You know they ain't learning American racism over there. They ain't learning. In England, shit, you think they learn about American racism? In England is racism corporate headquarters. They, like that's, <laughs> that is where it's created. <laughs> So, you know, these black Brits coming over here, they don't even know that they're walking into a situation that benefits them more than the people that's been on the ground longer than them. And that's the riff. We just don't know. <laughs> don't know shit, man. There's got to be something going on in England, man. There's got to be some racism over there, man. They ran off Meghan Markle. <laughs> you know how jacked up your country got to be to not fuck with rating Meghan Markle? You don't fuck with Meghan Markle. They ran her out of there. One of our best biracial double agents. <laughs> they sniffed her out immediately. <laughs> Meghan Markle could pass for eight, nine different races in America. But in England, they was like, no, something's off with that bitch. Uh, too many nigglers in her nabblers, if you don't know. Come on. England was so racist to Meghan Markle, she came back to America and stayed at Tyler Perry's house. <laughs> Do you understand how frustrated you have to be with racism? Did you, like, a pain that only Medea could fix. <laughs> then, then she talked to Oprah. <laughs> She was dealing with so much racism, she had to talk to two of the most powerful black women in the country. <laughs> had to get Medea and Oprah. Had to double up. And poor Oprah Winfrey. Oprah, Oprah was interviewing Meghan Markle. Oprah didn't have no solutions for that woman. <laughs> That's how complicated racism is in England. Oprah couldn't help her. Oprah, Oprah, this is a woman who has built her empire on giving us solutions to our problems. That's all Oprah's done. She had the, the, the talk show, she had the damn magazine, she's got a TV network. It's all promoting positive imagery to make you a better you. Megan Markle sat down in that backyard with Oprah for, Oprah for two hours. All she did was make faces. <laughs> Couldn't help Megan. Megan Markle poured her heart out to Oprah. Oprah was just sitting there like, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you with that, baby. You gotta talk to the ancestors. <laughs> Gail, let's go. I can't help her. We got to go, Gail. <laughs> yeah. These civil rights movies, man. They're painful, but they're necessary. To me, one of the best civil rights movies of all time is the original Fast and Furious. Listen, I'm sure you have your favorite. <laughs> but the original, not the sequels, not the original. The OG Fast and Furious, that's one of the most powerful fucking films. Paul Walker, if you don't remember, if you never saw the OG Fast and Furious, Paul Walker. Paul Walker is a cop in this movie. Paul Walker's job in the movie is to go undercover and take down a treacherous street racing gang that's being run by a black, Mexican-looking, Dominican, Italian, <laughs> Persian, whatever Vin Diesel is. He's gotta take him down. He's gotta take him down. And he does his job. Paul Walker does his job. Vin Diesel finds out he's a cop, takes off Paul Walker Peep's game. Vin Diesel crashes. Paul Walker gives Vin Diesel the keys to his car. Vin Diesel speeds away to freedom, and for the next 9, 10, 15 sequels, all Vin Diesel has done is save the world over and over again with nothing but minorities. It's beautiful. <laughs> All he's done is hire minorities left and right, formed a BIPOC coalition of street racers. He hired Tyrese, he hired Ludacris, he hired Bow Wow, he hired Ja Rule, <laughs> hired Michelle Rodriguez, grabbed the Asian from Tokyo Drift. Eva Mendes, even Wonder Woman was in one of the damn movies. He hired The Rock, whatever the fuck he is. 
The original Fast and Furious is proof of what a minority is capable of. If every now and then the police just let a nigga go. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's the only civil rights movie with a sequel. I'll say that. <laughs> I like Selma. Selma ain't got no sequel, do it? No, it don't. Ain't no Selma 2, Mo Selma. <laughs> Still walking, Mo Selma. <laughs> I'm gonna email Ava DuVernay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch that. <laughs> I'm like, Ava, I got an idea for a new Selma. <laughs> oh, man. Anything to feel good. Anything to feel good. We got people out there, man. They're doing whatever they can to feel good. They're helping other people. That's their crab leg, and I like that. I love seeing charity, philanthropy, people pouring into other people. You know what, you know what I really love seeing the last couple of years? Is seeing all of these celebrities that's getting folks out of jail. Now that's dope. That, that's been dope to see. These celebrities ain't messing around. Ain't damn Maya Moore from the WNBA, Alicia Keys, and Kim Kardashian. Even Kim Kardashian's ass got somebody out. No matter how you feel about Kim Kardashian, you gotta fucking tip the hat and look at that ass. Got, got a black woman to freaking appreciate her. <laughs> Them celebrities make it look easy as hell, too. They be getting folks out of jail the way you get folks in VIP. Yeah, that's my homeboy right there. Yeah, yeah him and him, they good. Yeah, get them out, yeah. Yeah, right there next to the electric chair, that's him. Yeah, get him out, okay. What I don't like though, what I don't like is what's weird is that when a celebrity gets somebody free, that's the one time they become humble. That's backwards. As soon as they get somebody out of, out of prison, they bring them to the Freedom Conference and they put them up front and uh, here they are, they are free and this, is, this moment is about them. And, uh, <laughs> no! If I got you out the jaws of injustice, I'm being your fucking P. Diddy immediately. <laughs> I would fucking Puff Daddy that press conference. <laughs> I'd push they free ass out the way, boom. I'm the one freedom, it's your boy, R. Wood, Birmingham, Alabama. 205 represent 3521, motherfucker. And he free cause of me, dawg, what's up? Cause that's how you get other celebrities on board. You make them jealous. Cause it ain't enough celebrities doing that shit, but it's a lot of celebrities talking about what diamond they got and what car they got and look at my house. Bitch, how many people have you freed from prison? <laughs> flex that. That's what you should be flex. Cause I can tell you right now, if I got somebody free from the, fe the federal government, <laughs> that's like beating the 96 Bulls. Do you understand? <laughs> If I got somebody free from the federal government, that's all you would know about me for the next five years. <laughs> motherfucker wouldn't even be allowed to go nowhere without me. I'd Jeff Dunham ventriloquist that motherfucker. I'd... He'd be on my hip right here for five. Come on, motherfucker, I got you out. We going, we going to Waffle House. Come with me, motherfucker. I'd walk the red carpet with him. So, Roy, I see you on the red carpet. What are you wearing? His name is Keith. I got him out. <laughs> this is my dog. How you doing? Keith, say something to the people, Keith. I'm happy to be free. Good job, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I love seeing it. And it was in seeing those celebrities get people out of jail that I finally found my crab leg. I was like, I'm gonna get me somebody out. You know? Got me a little bit of celebrity. I've been on BET three times. <laughs> you know? You know, my YouTube channel got 100,000 subscribers. You know? That's nothing to clap at, that's no money. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I figured it out, man. 
My childhood next door neighbor is in prison for murder. He's been gone 20 years so far. And when I say, when I say next door neighbor, I mean literally next door. Like, like on report card day, we could hear each other's ass whoopings. <laughs> you know, like that. You know, in the hood on report card day, you know, it sound like a zombie attack all over the neighborhood. <laughs> 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 you get to the bus stop the next morning and tease each other. Well, but I heard your ass whooping. That wasn't my ass whooping. That was his ass whooping. My dog Johnny Lee, man. Johnny Lee, that's an Alabama ass name for your ass. Yeah. She said, not Johnny Lee. Yes, baby, Johnny. Do you know him? <laughs> yes, Johnny Lee. My dog, Johnny Lee, man, he was a getaway driver in a robbery that turned into a murder. He didn't pull the trigger. Wasn't even in the store. But state of Alabama gave him 99 years. And I, don't, and I don't know what the laws are here, but in Alabama, the law is basically, if I'm with you and you murdered, we murdered. Which, damn that, they murdered. And I, under I understand the spirit of the law. It's to make you watch the company you keep. But it's a lot of court systems. They use that law to lock up two people for the price of one. And it don't feel right. It don't feel <laughs> right. It's the same thing with drugs. So you do the same, same thing with drugs. Like if I'm with you and you got cracked, somehow we got cracked. How we both got cracked? It's one cra it's a crack. We cannot both smoke <laughs> a crack. You seen the crack pipe? It's one mouthpiece. We can't, there's no couple's crack pipe. Like we cannot, <laughs> lady in the tramp. <laughs> the like I can see if they found a crack hookah. Okay, fine, you, you got me. I don't know, can you smoke crack in a hookah? I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about it later. But that's the law. So 99 years was the sentence. And I know that part of it, I know that part of it is who they killed. They killed this man, Mr. Muhammad, man. And Mr. Muhammad, he ran a black-owned record store in Birmingham. He killed a black business owner. This man ran this record store for years. This assaulted the community. Side, sidebar, young people. A record store is a place. <laughs> In the before times, there was a building you would go to to buy the music. It did not just come to your phone. You, you had to go to a building, and then you say, do you have the music? And then they would say yes or no, and then you would leave the mall. A mall is a place <laughs> where there used to be jobs and happiness. It was a dope spot. Old people would come there and exercise. It was a good hang. But Mr. Muhammad, man, Mr. Muhammad took the money he made from that record store and he had pulled it right back into the black community in Birmingham. He would mentorship programs, police athletic leagues, he'd buy blazers for kids to wear to job interviews, all that. This is how much he loved black people. He supported local rappers. <laughs> Sidebar, white people. Local rappers <laughs> are terrible. <laughs> and their dreams should never be supported. 98% of the rappers from where you live are terrible. They are not going to make it. But Mr. Mr. Muhammad, he supported them because he knew if they was in the studio, they wasn't on the street. Supported them, and that means supported, supported them. Gave them prime real estate in the record. Well, put their albums by the register where you could see it. Then guilt you into buying and supporting local. You'd show up to the, I'd show up to the record store to buy cash money or Master P or whatever, and he'd size you up and, oh, okay, you support New Orleans, but I don't see you supporting Birmingham. <laughs> Stare at you with them civil rights eyes. <laughs> hmm? You buying all these out-of-town rappers, you ain't even bought the new Buckle Up Knuckle Up Volume 2. <laughs> I'm like, who the fuck is Buckle Up Knuckle Up? I didn't even know they had a volume one. I got that one right here too, young blood. Ain't no thing. Mm, 
me support both of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You leave a record store with $80 worth of music. Supported me. That store supported me. I used to do prank phone calls back in the day. Prank phone calls was my first hustle. The people who know, they know. And so they would take my pranks and put them in the store and help me sell them. And that little bit of money that I made in that store from selling them prank calls, that was the difference between sleeping in my car and sleeping in a hotel on the road. Like that money, yeah, a lot of money. Because it was either Mr. Muhammad or his son, Darius. It was usually his son, Darius. Darius is the one who would call me up every week to give me the count. And on Monday morning, you, you wanted a call from Darius. Because that means you had some bread coming. Hey, young blood, good news. You sold three. Come on down here and get your $18, young blood. And I raced to that store to get them $18. Because that little bit of money saved my life, dog. That store supported people. And that's who they killed. That's who they killed. And I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna sit here and say that 20 years is enough time, but I know 99 ain't the number either. So I called up Darius. I called up Mr. Muhammad's son. I called up Darius and we're, we're cool, but we don't talk on a regular, but we're cool enough. And I call up Darius, and I start walking, walking him through what I'm thinking about trying to get Johnny Lee, trying to get him eligible for parole. And Darius stopped me dead in my tracks. He said, Roy, if that man gets out of prison, it'll kill my mama too. And that's something I'd never considered in the whole time that I've been thinking about doing this. Because the thing is that once you get locked in on something and what you want to do and what your agenda is, you forget about all the other people that have been affected by something. And I lost sight of that. I ain't never had nobody in my family murdered, so I, I didn't even have the perspective. I learned two things in talking to, talking to this brother. First thing I learned, number one, if it ain't your pain, it ain't your place to tell somebody when to get past something. So, like, folks be suffering and dealing with stuff. You need to get over that. You need to get, oh, man, you gotta let them process that. That's their journey. That's their journey, and I hope that brother will forgive me because what I did was hella disrespectful. You 20 years past the death of your father and some goofy-ass comedian called you, hey, man, I saw Kim Kardashian, fat ass, get somebody out of the book. <laughs> what you see you and me help getting him? I just hope the brother will forgive me, man. I was just trying to feel good. The other thing I learned in talking to this brother is also I'm not famous enough to get nobody out of prison any damn way. <laughs> not Alabama. <laughs> I ain't got the resume. I need to host a daily show. Correspondent ain't enough. <laughs> that might be enough in Colorado, but trust me, it ain't enough in Alabama. <laughs> ain't but two people getting you out of prison in Alabama. That's Nick Saban and barbecue. That's it. <laughs> But I understand what Darius is going through. I understand what that brother is going through in the sense of revenge, you know? Anything to feel good. And a lot of us, the only way we know how to feel good is to get revenge on somebody else. And I'm here to tell you, it do feel good. <laughs> oh my God, revenge feel good. I ain't saying it's full of nutrients. It ain't gonna help you in the long run, but in the short run, it feels good to get a little revenge on somebody sometimes. Because revenge, that's an impulse we learn at an early age. We learn revenge early. It's not taught. It's something that's just in us because you see someone who got away with something and they ain't got their thump behind the ear yet and you gotta make the world right. My son, when he was four, bit a kid at school. Four years old, just chomp down on another boy's flesh. <laughs> just chomp down, like Rottweiler. Just, like, he didn't bite and disengage. He, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so we go to the school, we go to the school for the bite meeting. You know, that's, that's what they do with the parents. They sit us down, they sit us down for the bite meeting. And come to find out at the bite meeting, my boy bit the same kid that bit him the year before. That's all in the game, fam. 
this is not an incident, this is justice. <laughs> like, I was proud, I was proud of my boy, because not only did he bite this child, but he waited a year to do it. <laughs> do you know how diabolical that is? This is a bite, this is an intimate attack. This ain't throwing a rock from across the park. You gotta lure somebody in to bite them. That means you gotta earn their trust. You gotta share snacks, you gotta share toys. And then one day on the yard, when the CEO wasn't looking, he was like, good job, dog, good job with that. We act like revenge is a substitute for healing, and that's the problem. Revenge is not a substitute for healing. Because no matter what, no matter what wrong has been done to you, no matter how mean you think somebody did you, at the end of the day, it's on you to heal yourself. Forgiveness is an internal journey. It's the truth. So you can be mad at them as long as you want, but it ain't gonna fix what you got to fucking do that work on your own. But in the meantime, talk that shit. <laughs> This concept of never letting go of something, even after people have apologized, even after people have tried to work with you to heal on it, I understand. If you don't understand that, go to a civil rights museum. And then you'll understand the concept of never forgiving. Because you go to a civil rights museum, I don't know about y'all, but I, I, when I leave the civil rights museum, I am not in a forgiving mood. <laughs> I am not ready to have a dialogue. <laughs> Them civil rights movies. That's why I like the way they design these new civil rights museums they've been building, where they put a bunch of good news right before the exit. <laughs> Have you seen that? The, the new civil rights museums, all of them, just it's, it's struggle, struggle, struggle. Every level, it's just struggle, struggle, struggle. And then you get up to the top level right before you leave. It's like, yeah, it went to Houston, Obama, Easter Ray. <laughs> and you leave and you feel good. Like, ah, oh, yeah, there is some good news. I like that Issa Rae. I ain't gonna fight no white people today. I feel good. Cause you go through a civil rights museum, you don't wanna let that shit go. Shit didn't even happen to me. That's not my generation, but it is my history and I'm still mad. Still mad. And it's been way more than 20 fucking years. You go through these pictures, you know what's wild about a civil rights museum? Is that you, you can look at these pictures of these people, these black people being defamed being defiled and just syrup in the head and people hitting them with sticks. And what's wild is to realize in that moment that most of the people in those pictures are still alive. That's the wild shit about a civil rights museum. They are showing you people that are mostly still taking in breath on this earth. The black people in the picture are alive, so if they're alive, motherfucker, that means the white people in the picture are alive too. Where they at? That's who I want to have a dialogue with. <laughs> Track down these motherfuckers, but you can't find them because in the picture, they all nice and young. You don't know what they look like today at old age. If only there was an app. <laughs> I hope you feel good, Deborah. Good night. Thank you all. I hope you feel good. Thank you all. You've been playing in this box this whole time?